Good evening to all my friends in Asia and Far East Asia in Australia, New Zealand. And good morning to our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Rakesh Kumar. Good morning, sir. Morning. Today we have the 11th edition of Art and Talk for 2023. And today's topic is IEEE Roadmaps Outlining Technology Innovations for Humanitarian Solutions. We have with us Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who is a life IEEE Fellow and IEEE Technical Activity Hall of Honor member. He is the Chair of IEEE Roadmaps, Chair IEEE Database Strategy Ad Hoc, and Chair IEEE Data Port. He is the President, Technology Connections in Corporations. Welcome you, sir. And with these words, I would request our Director, Region 10, Professor Lance Fung, to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce today's speaker to the audience. Welcome, Professor Lutz. Hey, good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay, uh, for organizing uh, and another excellent Region 10 talk. And also, once again, thank you so much uh, for Rakesh Kuma, our distinguished lecturers for today, sharing with us with this topic on IEEE Roadmaps Outlining Technology Innovations for Humanitarian Solutions. But I must go back, well, a few years ago that when I first, well, encountered uh, Dr. Kumar, well, under the next the new initiatives committee, whereby I was the, the committee member and subsequently become the chair. Well, we have um, met a few times, well, in terms of the project proposal, and then um, we have provided the support for the roadmaps. And I must say that uh, well, we are, I'm, I'm really glad that well, Nick has been involved and instrumental in uh, supporting the, the roadmap because, well, as well, you will see here well, from some of the sharing today that the roadmap is going to provide well, a lot of information, the resources, and for the benefits well, for the members and for also for the industry. So I'm, I'm really honored well, to have this opportunity well to introduce well the speaker well by sharing with you the bio well of Dr. Rakesh Kumar. Well, Dr. Kumar is a semiconductor industry veteran, an entrepreneur, and an educator. And currently, he chairs the IEEE Technical Activities Database Strategy Ad Hoc and the Roadmaps Committees and Data Port. He participates in the IEEE 2050 Future Directions and the Industry Engagement Committees. He has been IEEE SSCS President and IEEE HKN Governor and on the board of the IEEE SSCS, TMES and SSIT. Those are a couple of the society within our IEEE. He is the founder, president, and CEO of the Technology Connections. He educates and mentors in IEEE VOLT, stands for Volunteers of, well, of Leadership Training, and potentials for well, entrepreneurs at US, the UCSD, uh, University of California in San Diego. But Dr. Kumar authored well, the book, well, Fabless well, Fab well, Semiconductor Implications, Implementations, published by McGraw-Hill, he is in the IEEE Tech Hall of Honors, and during his 40-plus years in the semiconductor industry, he has been the VP and GM, the okay, Vice President and General Manager at uh, Candence Design, and has held various technical and management positions at Unisys and Motorola. So we are really privileged well, to have well, him with us well, this evening or this afternoon, sharing with his experience and introducing the IEEE Roadmaps. And I believe the participant is going to benefit much well from the sharing. And well, without further ado, now I pass it back to you, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lance. Thank you for the introduction. And now may I request Dr. Kumar to kindly start the presentation. Over to Dr. Kumar, please. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Lance, for the introduction. Um, I did a version of this talk at the Sections Congress, a shorter version, and so uh, I was requested to, to get a more expanded version, and, you know, I can talk forever on this topic, of course. Uh, I've been leading this uh, Roadmaps Committee for now about four years at IEEE, and we've made a lot of progress, and um, a lot of interesting stuff that I would like to tell you about. Um, so let's get started. Um, I had a slide on my 
background, but I think that's uh, all been. Whoops. Why it's not in black? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a long term industry professional, a lot older than I look, but that's okay. Um, and so, what are we going to talk about? There, um, I thought we, we should cover uh, three topics. One, in general, I'll quickly review the technology directions that we are all facing uh, in, in everyday life. And, and you know, there's a whole different presentation about what our um, experts in semiconductors have accomplished over the years. And, and yet, it's an extremely challenging field to do even more. So uh, there are huge gaps, and you know, if, if I was talking to you about climate change, um, you know, we've made a lot of changes and a lot of progress uh, to achieve the goals that I'm going to show you. Um, but it's very exciting, and and uh, that's the context I'd like to set the uh, roadmaps in, because they help you provide uh, the insight into what's coming down the pike. Uh, we have four release roadmaps that I will tell you about, and we have many that are in the works. And then I'll pick, um, I think mostly from the networking roadmap, uh, a couple of um, very interesting humanitarian applications uh, that should be of interest to you. So we all know uh, and technology has changed our lives. Uh, many of you yourselves are creating the solutions. And, and there are many, many challenges on the way. Um, many new product opportunities, um, many technology innovations are needed. Uh, they generally tend to be very uh, multidisciplinary. So there is, it's hard to find any one technology area that creates a new product. Um, it may start with that. Um, I'll give you a quick example. You know, if you were to try to implant a chip in the brain, it's not about the design of the chip. It's about the process technology. It's about how you encapsulate that. It's how you get the signals out of it, the neural signals. How do you process those? Um, the the uh, data that comes out of there, how do you deal with that in AI or ML fashion? So there's a lot of different technologies that have to come together to make things work. Uh, we at IEEE are not that great at uh, combining technologies, so that's kind of my passion here to try to uh, expand our directions uh, in that space. So I thought I'd show you a couple charts from Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger um, and, and last year's um, Intel Day. He's showing, just look at the curve on the right, he's talking about a, a huge market opportunity where, you know, people have gone from full realism full immersion to intelligent avatars and bots uh, to virtual economies. And, and that is generating data that is, um, you know, zettabytes of data. Uh, you probably haven't even heard of 10 to the 27 and 10 to the 30th uh, bits um, of data. So that's, that's the other uh, ad hoc that I uh, lead. Uh, but pretty, really exciting opportunities. And, and all this is going to require technology semiconductor technology, packaging technology, design technology, all of those things have to come together. Uh, another chart from um, Pat Gelsinger uh, is talking about intelligent devices everywhere, and uh, he calls it the democratization of uh, performance. So if you stop and think about this, how is this going to happen? You have to have technology evolution. So here's one example of the uh, cell phone. They were um, discovered in the, uh, invented in the 1980s uh, with a voice phone. If, if those of you that were around, there was a huge chunk of um, electronics that you had to carry with you to be able to make a phone call. Uh, then in the 90s, you got texting capability, and things really took off in the 2000s when you got digital networking and wireless connectivity. Uh, at that time, I used to consult at Qualcomm, and they were projecting that you would literally see the world where everybody's on their phone and, and they're able to get all the information they need 
uh, just like from a computer. And literally today, walking at the airport or wherever, you know, I, I would say 90% of the people are walking with their eyes on the cell phones. Uh, I'm surprised if you don't run into each other, but that's life today, right? And it's going to get uh, even more uh, intense in terms of what you can do with those little devices in your hand. Um, we added video capability. There's um, all kinds of things that came on board with 5G. By the way, another experience in Europe, um, you know, here in the U.S., we use 5G all the time. Uh, in Europe, my uh, uh, cell provider, uh, you know, we were getting LTE and 4G in many places, but the battery was not lasting very long. So that's one of the side advantages of 5G is a much more power efficient uh, system. Um, so uh, lots of capability, um, literally do most of the work on, on the um, phone. You still need your laptop, but um, what's coming down is, is the next generation. You know, some people call it 6G. We like to call it next generation because it may actually see a blending of uh, cellular and Wi-Fi, uh, for instance, coming together. Uh, obviously, the, the drive for speed and latency uh, capacity and reliability and, and for pervasive applications. So all of these things will happen um, based on advances in semiconductor technology, packaging, and on and on and on, all right? <coughs> so if you are, um, oh, another example here might be the Industry 4.0, which uh, you may be seeing in some of your countries where um, you know, now people are starting to talk about Industry 5.0, we're automating the manufacturing process, uh, make it quicker, faster, more efficient, and, and all of those things will continue to happen. So this is an interesting field of technology where we always want more. In fact, at the um, European Solid State Circuit Conference, there was a panel discussion on, on the strengths and gaps uh, in the European Union for technology. And one very, very senior gentleman said, well, you know, why are we having, why do we keep wanting to put more chips on, a, more transistors on a chip? Why don't we slow it down a little bit? And everybody in the audience basically said, that's not going to happen, right? Because we as consumers want more, we want more efficient devices. Um, lower power, make the battery last longer. Those are demands that are not going away. In fact, uh, they're going to continue to to advance the technology. <clears throat> so the question is, if you're in the industry and you're trying to predict what technology is coming down the pike, uh, that's where the roadmaps come in. Right? Um, you have a desire to look at um, you know, most companies will do a roadmap that's six months to 12 months out. Whoops, what's happening here? Um, but you don't know what's coming down three, five, ten years down the road. And uh, what are the roadblocks? And some of these roadblocks require long, long term solutions. So, what IEEE roadmaps is positioned is to provide that kind of information. Um, the committee was formed uh, four years ago, as I mentioned. Uh, we have four published technical roadmaps. Anybody can ac uh, access those at roadmaps. Oops, get an automation engine built in here. Um, for, uh, you can access them at roadmaps.ieee.org, and, and there are many more on the horizon. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, I would like to distinguish that what we do here is within IEEE are technical roadmaps. So we will talk, I'll, I'll show you examples, but what is the basic technology that's required um, and predicted to happen? Uh, companies will take that evolution and create internal product roadmaps. And, and I just want to distinguish those because product roadmaps tend to be very competitive. Uh, companies will do that in order to provide visibility to their people uh, and customers as to what products are coming down the pike, but um, they're, they're in the competitive space. Our technical roadmaps are pre-competitive, and that's the reason we can pull in people from different parts of the industry, government, uh, and other institutions to come help decide what technologies will be coming down the pike. 
Um, so as I said, yes, we bring together people from the industry, the academia, government, research entities, and we form working groups. And uh, for each roadmap, there are what we call working groups, some people call them focus teams, whatever, um, different uh, departments, if you will, that discuss details of their own technical trends, what's happening, what has happened well. Yeah, I don't know how this is happening. Um, maybe the timing is still, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay. Um, and I'll give you examples in those areas. And, and we predict different roadmaps are different, but some go out five years, some go out 10, 15 years, and, and maybe even longer. And uh, the roadmaps are refreshed every year to two years. Um, but typically, we will do a complete rewrite every two years and refresh it um, in between years. So you can ask the question, why does anybody need these base technology roadmaps. Uh, I kind of hinted at this is most companies are pretty short term and they're looking at their roadmaps. The funding agencies are looking at these roadmaps to, come on, um, to um, decide which technologies to fund. And um, so the question is why do people need this? And, and uh, most CEOs that have told me is that we find IEEE to a roadmap to be an independent resource, unbiased reference for them to base their work on. Uh, the CEO typically that um, uh, told me was, you know, I can't decide whether my people are doing the right thing or how that relates to what the industry is doing. So that's the value that we bring to the, the uh, uh, industry as a whole. The other value that we bring to the industry is that Within the roadmaps, we will identify gaps and what we call brick walls. So in some areas, when you predict, uh, you know, uh, technologies, you know, five, 10 years out, uh, there are some solutions that you know what you need, you know how to get there, uh, but work needs to be done. Uh, those we might um, identify as yellow areas. If we know where we want to go, what parameters we want to achieve, but we have no clue how to do, make that happen, we will create those as brick walls. And history says that, you know, this ITRS, the first roadmap I will talk about is the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors was actually uh, put together in the early 90s um, by the organization in the US, uh, the SIA, Semiconductor Industry Association and Semitech. And and there they use the same uh, same methodology where the industry came together in multi dimensions. So semiconductor people were driving this, but the semiconductor equipment people came together. The design and EDA people, electronic design automation people came together and created solutions that then took technology to the next level. So we followed that same methodology uh, that ITRS. Um, uh, was picked up by IEEE. Uh, ITRS um, was terminated actually in the early 2010 areas, 2015 or so. And then IEEE picked this up. Uh, we expanded the scope of the ITRS into International Roadmap for Devices and Systems. And um, it has been around uh, the longest um, among our roadmaps. It, has uh, over a million views in 2022. Um, it is an integral part of the uh, European Union CHIPS Act. Uh, that's part of the reason why I was in Europe at the conference, uh, meeting with the leader of the International Cooperation on, on Semiconductors and Cyanano. And uh, so everybody there was referencing uh, IRDS. Uh, I have not personally talked to the Japan uh, CHIPS Act people, but uh, apparently, we are integrated into the Japan Chips Act as well. Um, maybe Takaka knows better, um, but that might be an interesting discussion to have. Our lead for this is Dr. Paolo Gargini. He's the ex CTO of Intel from many years ago and uh, well respected around the world. Um, and he's been managing those uh, directly. Um, so uh, we are referenced in the U.S. Chips Act. Uh, things are moving a little slower there, um, and and uh, some competition too, I guess. Um, 
we make many presentations, there are conferences. I think there's a, a nanotech conference coming up maybe in the next month or so. Uh, so if you're interested in more detail on, on the uh, chapters within uh, IRDS, you're welcome to uh, participate. Um, I am also working with the Korea government, uh, Apollo NIR, where they are using IRDS as a basis um, to formulate their strategy moving forward. Okay, um, so what is, um, uh, I think um, IRDS has 15, they call focus teams, the working groups I was talking about. Here's an example chart, and um, this was shown by a couple of different presenters at the conference uh, in Europe as well. So it's kind of the basis for uh, what people are using um, in terms of um, uh, deriving information. So the way this, this uh, plays out is that uh, on the top are, I hope you can read this, is uh, years. It goes out to 2035, so that's uh, roughly 15 years out. Um, and then the different uh, transistor structures um, at the logic level for logic transistors, uh, moving from, uh, you know, uh, gate uh, FinFETs to uh, uh, gate all around devices to vertical gate all around devices. And, and then you list a bunch of parameters. Um, I know those of you that are semiconductor experts probably know that there's a, a lot of game playing and, and calling the technology nodes um, by the dimensions. Um, we have actually proposed a methodology of how to do it more systematically. Um, in 2034, you will have pitches that are at 16 nanometer, although people are talking about the, you know, four nanometer and, and angstrom level technologies. So just be careful. Um, you can uh, reference the roadmap if you have a doubt. Uh, here also you see the yellow and the red zones. And what that means is in 2020, let's take an example, 2025, you're not sure how to do the 21 uh, nanometer uh, contact uh, CD. Um, I don't know if you can see my area uh, cursor. Um, and so those are yellow zones, um, red zones, or we don't know how to do that, and it requires uh, effort uh, together from the industry. <clears throat> the next roadmap is the heterogeneous integration roadmap. The primary focus is on packaging aspects. Um, I think for a long time you probably have heard that Moore's Law is dying or dead or whatever terms people use. Uh, I think those people are kind of eating their humble pie because um, um, the um, technology is continuing to uh, advance, um, not just in the semiconductor side, but as a combination of bringing together multi-processors, uh, um, chiplet uh, architectures that help keep the chip level system solutions uh, continuing on the path that um, uh, maybe in escalating in some cases. Um, it is also referenced in the U.S. Chips Act and uh, they make many, many, many presentations throughout the year bringing together leaders uh, in the industry. Uh, quite impressive. Let me show you some examples. Here's a more traditional example of a heterogeneous integration where if you have um, connectivity parts, uh, microcontroller parts, and MEM sensors, they get stacked together. Um, and uh, in this case, they're wire bonded uh, onto the substrate, which becomes the LGA package. This uh, shows the next level detail. Uh, in, in the example on the left, you've got situation where you got a um, logic die with antennas and, and discrete devices all together, and then on the right is um, a situation where you got the die stacked on top of a couple of dies. So this has been going on for 10, 20 years maybe now, um, and, and so that's not really new. What's new is the examples of um, high performance uh, processors that have been announced by AMD and NVIDIA with multi-chip packaging. Um, can see the pictures there, uh, NVIDIA Hopper in 2022 and AMD's 2023 um, uh, M1300 device. Um, Foveros is the Intel version where they stack uh, devices with uh, micro bumps and uh, embedded uh, micro infrastructure. 
um, here's, uh, you probably heard the term chiplets. So uh, uh, lots of chiplets that are being uh, uh, put together and, and what it's creating an interesting dynamic shift in the semiconductor industry. For those of you that have been around for a long time, the whole um, cadence of every two to three years getting a new process technology was based on increasing the number of transistors you can get per chip, increasing the performance per chip, and the cost of the integrated device was going down. Uh, I've been in many companies where if, unless the, the crossover point from one node to the next used to be that it became cheaper um, to do the integrated device than the individual devices. And the shift that's happening now is that they're saying, well, we don't need to have all parts of the, the SOC system on chip to be in this leading edge technology. Why not take older chips that are in the IO, for instance, uh, that don't need to be um, at the leading edge uh, seven nanometer node um, and uh, use it as is and uh, integrate it on a modularized SOC. Um, question in my mind personally is I, I hope that's working out from the economic perspective because uh, if you know Moore's law was really an economic law and, and how that's going to play out, I don't really know. But today people are shipping chips and integrated devices um, for AIML solutions, for network switch solutions, for servers, for PCs, uh, you name it, right? And you could take an example where the server has a CPU as peripheral functions and, and they get integrated as a chip, uh, chiplet thing on, on the right side. So um, many examples that you will find in the industry uh, that, that these are being used. Okay, um, switching gears to wide band gap semiconductors. So uh, I just bought a, a power a charger for my laptop, which is half the size of uh, what came with the laptop. Um, and has as much or more power that it can deliver. Uh, that is afforded by the use of technologies like um, silicon carbide and gallium nitride, which allow the chips to be smaller and get you more functionality. Uh, that kind of um, technology direction is mapped out in this ITRW. The first edition came out in 2019. I think they've done one update and they're getting ready for another update. What was interesting is, again, in the Europe conference, uh, they were talking about um, a very serious effort from Fraunhofer in Germany, where they're looking for silicon carbide and, and gallium nitride um, roadmaps. So uh, we're going to have a meeting together to see if we can work together uh, on developing that. Um, this last one is the um, network next generation networking roadmap. Uh, it has uh, 14 uh, different uh, working groups. You can see the, the applications and services. I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, connecting the unconnected, uh, very serious issues that they're addressing. Uh, there are obviously technical issues as well that they're addressing, and I'll talk about the test bed as well. Um, so they're getting traction. There's uh, about 1,500 views per month of the roadmap. Um, they are make many presentations, six conferences, seven webinars, technical workshops. Um, for those of you that know, Ashutosh Tata is uh, one of the leaders of this. I mean, he is all over uh, traveling and, and making, uh, taking leadership role in um, making these um, um, events happen. Okay. Um, Lots of podcast series, so it's a lot of interesting information in there. Um, here are the different uh, working groups, and each of those can be downloaded from the website. So let's talk a little bit about connecting the unconnected. There are over 3 billion people in the world that have no internet connectivity. I don't know if you knew that, uh, and that's the basis of what uh, these folks are looking at is how can we go make technology happen that uh, we can provide the reach to the people. Um, there's lots of system level work to be done, spectrum allocation, a lot of technical issues that have to be resolved. Um, here's a picture of what kinds of activity that um, 
they are formulating in their uh, roadmap, uh, the use of digital public goods, the different forms of AI, ML, and, and uh, apps and models that have to be made available to have the basic uh, internet available just everywhere on the left. And then as you get close to information spots in, in the areas where there is no uh, internet, they can go subscribe to it. And so those are the kinds of things that they're bringing together. Um, there's a new standard that's uh, evolving, is 802.22, the YFR standard that's going to talk about how um, uh, the spectrum is going to reach uh, uh, the rural communities and, and all over the world. And you can, again, uh, access that and look at the detail. The Applications and Services Working Group is um, looking at many dimensions of uh, agriculture, education, healthcare, the electrical power, media, you know, you can read all of them. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples, uh, especially in the agriculture space, because I think they're very fascinating. So, uh, we're all aware of IoT devices. If you combine that effort with networking and computing and apply it to precision agriculture, this is a cartoon that I got from the IoT magazine. They're talking about IoT that's in uh, drones, it's in uh, um, pH meter that measures the acidity of the soil, uh, in the tractor, um, in, in the temperature controllers, uh, um, percent humidity, uh, all kinds of stuff, right? And, and those then need to come together to solve problems. So we had a, um, a panel we did uh, last year, and uh, Professor Jinfei Wang from Western Ontario University showed this information, so this is really her work. Um, what it does is it combines these IoT solutions into sensors, the remote sensing of uh, what's happening uh, on the farm, in the farm, and uh, high position positioning systems where the tractors can be uh, tracked, and uh, a geo mapping of what's uh, uh, growing and if there are any diseases in there. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, automated steering systems. By the way, if you're interested in this, uh, I have been very impressed with uh, John Deere's products. Um, I don't know the others, but uh, they have a very strong presence in the technical space, very impressive products. They can actually have tractors that move um, um, and, and can actually plant a seed and fertilize it at the same time and then go back and um, detect a weed and spray the weed uh, specifically. Um, very, very impressive because what this does is it reduces the uh, waste and it, it uh, helps the environment, it helps uh, the fertilizer go where it's needed and the weed killer go where it's needed. So, I mean, these are very, very uh, successful technology advancements um, uh, along these lines. Um, so, the, the, what technologies that need to come together for this uh, uh, precision agriculture is remote sensing, global positioning systems, and mapping software. And it allows you to make decisions, uh, um, site-specific decisions, uh, variable rates for fertilizers, pesticides. It, it is, is uh, very uh, impressive. So here's an example of um, multi-temporal uh, radar satellite. Uh, so you get a picture on the left, and then it uh, parses it down into different um, um, types of uh, crops that are there. There's uh, corn and forest, uh, uh, forage, soil, soybean, tobacco, uh, different colors as you can see on the right. And then they can um, parse it down further into uh, a nitrogen estimate map. And, and uh, the greens on the right then show you where the nitrogen um, uh, canopy is high versus where it's low. And so now you can um, go and uh, if you want to enhance the nitrogen, you, you spray that in the um, um, brown zones. So very impressive, uh, didn't used to be around. Um, and uh, another thing you can do within this precision agri agriculture space is that you can detect diseases. So um, uh, 
lead blight, bacterial leak spots, yellow curl, whatever, right? And then you can identify what the specific disease is for the specific plant and then go treat it accordingly. Um, you know, and, and farmers used to do that um, just by looking at things. Here's uh, automating it and doing it uh, in a precision fashion. Um, so these are tracked by the application and services group. Uh, another area that the network generation roadmap is really doing to help the industry is that, uh, you know, we all hear a lot about 5G, but 5G actually has many limitations. Um, and there's some of them are listed here, your, uh, spectrum and security privacy issues, limited deployment. And so as the um, 5G capabilities are evolving, what the industry needs is a test bed where they can go evaluate some of the enhancements that they're doing. Um, so IEEE has launched this um, innovation test bed that is actually funded by uh, a number of industry partners where they, uh, anybody can now go test and experiment and collaborate and innovate their solutions, try them out before they launch in the industry um, and as a real product. So we're proud to be supporting that. And uh, I'm gonna switch gears now to, so that was the four roadmaps that, that we already have. The on the horizon roadmaps, there's one that's uh, getting pretty close to publication. It's called the International Technology Roadmap Power Electronics for Distributed Energy Systems. So if you look at the power distribution system all the way from generation to transmission to uh, distribution down to your power charging on your smartphone or your laptop. Um, that's what they look at. It's driven by the Power Electronics Society and, and very um, interesting detail that they look at uh, for um, those distributed systems and, and how they're gonna evolve over the next few years. Uh, another one that's a success story for us is uh, last year in 2022, we went to the Power Energy Society uh, general meeting and um, presented them the value of roadmaps. They have picked up this uh, activity. They are, uh, I think they've developed a roadmap that's gonna be the fastest from start to finish. They just started January of this year and the roadmap is looking pretty good in terms of um, combining sustainability and the power generation and the usage of the power uh, and energy uh, capabilities. So stay tuned on this. The general process, by the way, if you pick a technical area and you wanna do a roadmap, you have to get the team together, do a white paper, and that white paper usually is the basis for creating the roadmap. Other roadmaps that are under the way, uh, underway are uh, IEEE Brain. So this is a perfect example, as I mentioned earlier, where many different technologies need to come together. And one of the values that um, we could, we IEEE could bring is to bring together those technical uh, communities that can then um, identify what technology is available today and what is, um, capable tomorrow and five years from now. So uh, we've been working with the uh, Engineering Medicine Biology Society uh, to help create this. Um, hopefully someday they have a really nice white paper um, that is available, I think on our website on the roadmaps. Um, another one is smart lighting. And when I heard that uh, earlier, uh, you know, when they proposed it, I said smart lighting, everybody has lighting everywhere, right? But optimizing lighting um, to maximize efficiency and sustainability, I think those are uh, key challenges that are being worked on. And, and I believe they're getting close to doing a white paper. Uh, telepresence is, uh, you know, especially in the COVID days, um, you know, even today I'm talking uh, from San Diego um, and predicting what can be done, who's saying what, and communicating better, that's uh, being brought out in the telepresence roadmap. Uh, LEOS is low Earth orbit satellites. Um, a lot of information is being generated. Um, by the way, what to do with the data that comes out, that's the other two committees that I lead. 
So um, pretty exciting stuff going on. Uh, there's public safety roadmap that's being considered. And another one that's uh, on the horizon is reliability. So those of you that are in the reliability society, it's a small society. There's about 2,000 people in there. And, and by the way, I'm now a member because uh, I think I can help them expand their capability because reliability is in everything that we do. Every technology, every product has to be reliable. And, and yet their community is just very focused on the basics of the models and the um, details. So we need to get them integrated into a broader spectrum of things and, and spell out a roadmap that people can uh, then look at. So um, what can you do? Um, I kind of position this as something that helps the industry. Hopefully you have um, acknowledged that uh, as I was talking. Um, you can actually participate in the development. So if you have the expertise, uh, if you have the expertise and you would like to participate in the working groups, certainly reach out to roadmaps at IEEE.org or reach out to me and I'll get you in touch with the right people. Um, you can certainly do that. You can also use the roadmaps um, if, if um, you don't want to develop it, but uh, there's a lot of useful information. Uh, I used to, when I was in the industry, um, even in executive positions, I would download the uh, executive summary. And usually that itself was uh, gave me 80 to 90% of the information I need. Um, and so I would recommend doing that um, a very uh, um, informational um, details that have uh, solidly been uh, vetted. Um, <clears throat> you can actually help develop a roadmap. So I'll tell you my own story. When I was a young professional, um, I think I was out of the industry after my PhD for maybe seven years. Um, I used to work at a company, the second largest computer company in the world at that time was Burroughs Corporation uh, in the semiconductor side of things. And I always observed that the use of predicting what technology to use was sort of an arbitrary, somebody heard something and they, they started to use it. And so I helped create a, uh, took the lead and created a roadmap. I knew nothing about systems. I was a semiconductor guy. And it was so enlightening for me. I learned a lot. I got to talk to people, um, and and it really helped shape my career. So, I would encourage young professionals, if you're kind of getting tired of your role in a particular space, and you will have the desire to expand your reach, go look at what roadmap you could create. It could be a small one, started, get visibility. And, and uh, I'll guarantee you it's going to help shape your career. So um, um, that, that's a case study of one, <laughs> which is mine. Um, but uh, I, I think it's very doable, and I'm a big believer in it. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I think it's 45 minutes, so I'm um, glad to take any questions uh, or comments that you have. Put everybody to sleep. You can't hear anybody. Yes, we, we are hearing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there are not many questions in the chat box. Um, there are no questions. Any questions that can come from the participants there? You can put it in the chat box, so Dr. Kumar will be glad to reply to your questions. I noticed Kukchan has joined. Thank you, Kukchan. I don't think there are any questions. Uh, Hi, Rakesh. Uh, huh. Are there any IP issue with sharing of technology through the roadmaps? Dr. Kumar, so, that yeah, question has come up. 
That, that's a good question. So IP, we actually, if you're talking about IP in terms of IP blocks that are used on the integrated circuit, we don't actually develop the IP ourselves. Um, as far as the intellectual property of what people share, uh, they bring that because it's open information. There's no proprietary stuff uh, in here. If you're a company representative, and you're doing something that's confidential or proprietary, we don't want you to share that with us. Um, does that kind of address your issue? Because IP can be a couple of different levels, right? When you come in to participate in a working group, you own some intellectual property, your company owns some, but we do not want you to share that um, proprietary information. Um, you got to work in the open space. And then the other IP usage is usually the, the IP blocks that are used um, in chip design, for instance. So we don't really get into that. Any more questions? We can take one or two more questions, please. Uh, Sanjay, uh, can I ask a question? This is Cook Chen. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Thank Definitely. you. Thank you very much. Hi, Rakesh. Uh, the, yeah. Yes, so yeah, it's good to see you again. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, again, you know, the, I really appreciate your, uh, uh, the effort of your team uh, on uh, continuing the uh, roadmaps. We, uh, you know, the, we know that the ITRS you know, ended in 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as you said, uh, you know, IEEE is the uh, uh, appropriate, um, you know, the institution for continuing that activity. Mm -hmm. And my question is on the <clears throat> how to, uh, you know, get a, a good input from industry, because you know the uh, well, as you mentioned, the Korean government uh, is trying to establish the national level uh, roadmaps. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, you know I'm part of it, but uh, the Korean industry is like a Samsung or Hynix. You know they are quite reluctant to uh, get involved into that uh, because I guess uh, they are afraid of uh, you know the uh, rebuilding their uh, own uh, technology or their own uh, strategy. So uh, they are not really uh, helpful. So. Especially in the uh, devices area, it's uh, mainly from the academics or research institute. Uh, how did you, uh, you know, the, get the uh, good input from the industry sector? So I think the trick is to keep the boundary <clears throat> between what's proprietary to Samsung mm -hmm. versus what's generic information. So if they can take their proprietary information. Mm -hmm. And in a team discussion related to what has already been published, what the roadmap is identifying what can be achieved in, let's say, five years, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. so you don't have to tell us the detail of what you're doing or how you're doing it. You have to give us your perspective on, on what can be done in five mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. and what kinds of efforts have to be taken to get there. Right. And so I think if you can establish that kind of a norm, um, then I think it should be okay. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a very real concern. It happens all around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why we really say it's a, a pre-competitive basic technology roadmap. So we, we, the other side of it would be once you have this roadmap, then they can, um, you know, at Samsung, look at the, you know, what is the roadmap predicting for 10 years out? And how that could affect their own internal product roadmap as to how they implement. Does that clarify a little bit? It, it may yeah, take yeah. a little example of, you know, we can send a team or people to participate. I know there are people from Samsung and Hynix on the roadmap committee. So hopefully mm -hmm. they can communicate that too, right? So. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question, though. And thanks for all your help. Uh, Dr. G, one more question uh, is there in the chat box from Dr. Zia Ahmed. 
Okay. Is there any information about current working groups and future working groups? So the current working groups, I showed a couple. Uh, well, I showed the network one. Um, I think if you go to the IRS um, IRDS website, you will see. Even in the executive summary, they'll tell you the 15 focus teams. Um, and they continue to add if there's a new area. For instance, um, I, I'm, I don't know how current I am, but let's say they wanted to add quantum computing. Uh, I know there's a cryogenic team, but if they want to do a, a new team in um, quantum or some new technology area, um, they will create that and then um, invite people into that new area, new space. Does that kind of answer your question? So I, I can't predict what future ones are going to be. I can tell you what they are today. And we could probably, if you talk to the specific leaders, they will know what other um, groups are being considered. I don't know them off the top of my head. Uh, one more question has come up. That's from Prakash Lohana. How IEEE's roadmap emphasizes developments in energy storage, grid inter integration, and remote energy solutions? So um, that's a good question. I think that would be covered more by the power energy um, roadmap. They have a working group that's going to talk about uh, battery storage, where it is today, what it will be in five years, maybe 10 years, and how they might get there. So that would be the evolution that the roadmap would show. Um, what was the other part of your question? Um, I, I think it's a, a, the group of people coming together and saying, well, today we are doing this, Tomorrow we're going to be able to do these additional technology areas, and then maybe you do some validation with experts uh, in that space. And uh, again, if it's something that they know how to do it, that'll be a white space. If there's something that they're saying, yeah, that's a good good goal to set, but we don't know how to get there, that could be either yellow or a red brick uh, wall area. And and if that then requires multiple uh, disciplines of communities to come together, then that's the facilitation that the roadmap will 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 make happen. Am I answering your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There are no more questions. Uh, we can just now move on to the next. Uh, that's the. Closing session and thanksgiving by Dr. Zia. He is the vice chair, professional activities of Region 10 IEEE. And may I now request Dr. Zia Ahmed to kindly take the stage. Professor Zia Ahmed, doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. And, and thank you very much, um, Dr. Kumar. It was a very interesting talk. Um, it shows us where to look for information. Especially these roadmaps are very helpful for younger people to understand the technology trends and uh, to plan their future career path. Uh, I think especially young people who then there's so much development going on in so in so many fields and the integration of all the technologies to look for new solutions. Uh, these roadmaps are definitely a uh, great source. Uh, uh, for awareness. Uh, so thank you very much for bringing that uh, to our audience, and especially very, very uh, appreciated your effort to get up very early in the morning to give this talk. Um, uh, we really appreciate that. Um, uh, so thank you very much for this talk. And well, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, it was a pleasure doing it. And if there are any follow on questions, please reach out to me. Um, yeah. Is the recording going to be available? I will have to yeah, we, we have recorded this and in a week's time, this will be on region 10 YouTube channel. Uh, okay. where we upload all these talks. So our audience can go back and look at it. Um, mm -hmm. and, 
and especially i think for those people who are involved in developing solutions and uh, for them to understand you know, what is in the pipeline you know, how things are converging in especially for humanitarian application the example like precision ag agriculture was a good one uh, so i think it is this was really very informative talk so thank you very much well it's a pleasure I, i'll make a pitch for um my other uh, project ask ieee we have not uh, ingested the roadmap material but if you have some thoughts that that would be helpful we can certainly at least put the executive summaries in there. So if somebody wants to ask a quick question, get an answer, uh, we could do that. Um, we're also in that project looking at what questions do people out there want answered. So some kind of an assessment there because um, we want to do what people really need, right? So. You see, especially I think people who are looking to, to innovate things, mm -hmm. um, these roadmaps are a good source of information to know what is there, which they can use you know, for innovative purposes you know, for humanitarian application as well as for networking and you know, all, all these fascinating things which are uh, un, you know, <coughs> under development. Yeah, so yep. it, it's a great source of these roadmaps. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lance, for inviting thank me, you. Sanjay, Zia, uh, Kokchen, uh, Takako, Kash, Akila. Thank you so much again, Prakash. All yeah. the best. All right. Let's thank you. Uh, you can give us our feedback on by scanning the QR code. And uh, we are extremely happy to have Dr. Rakesh Kumar with us today itself. We have been planning this for the last two months, if you can yeah. recall, Dr. Kumar, and today we have succeeded in successfully conducting the program. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Artem so Talk is a joint venture um, of Region 10 Committee of YP Industry Region Professional Activities, Student Activities, and Life Member Activities, Humanitarian also, as well as we. So, thank you all to the chairs for all these committees. And thank you all for participating in today's. Our next webinar is on 12th October. That's building trust through IEEE standard, SA standards. There are two talks. It will be in the workshop mode, IEEE AI ethics and governance standards and certification. And number two will be soft law for age appropriate digital design for children. A case study on IEEE 2089, 2021. That's coming up on Thursday, 12th October. And time is 1.30 p.m. to 2.50 p.m. of Singapore time. So please be stay tuned with us for further announcement. The flyers will be posted soon. You can connect with us with LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And I think thank you to all for your active participation. Stay tuned and see you at the next webinar. Thank you all. So we will just uh, have our cameras on for the group photograph. And I think... Uh, Renu, are you ready with the group photograph for Akila? I will take one from my end, sir. Take one from your end, yes. Done, Varunika? One more, please. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank